he'll talk on the subjects of karma and rebirth. Now people are quite interested in the, these particular words, subjects. Many popular books and programs have been on reincarnation and rebirth and karma and so forth. And people ask, how can there be, if there isn't any soul, how can anything be reborn? What is reborn again? If somebody was, uh, uh, what carries through from one life to the next, if there's no soul? And then the karma is oftentimes used for all kinds of things. Thinking uh, karma is a kind of, people can just say it's their karma, and they, people say, they're suffering, they're miserable, because that's their karma. So people would think it's just kind of a fatalistic picture. And that reincarnation <laughs> Can you hear me all right? <laughs> Could you... <laughs> can you hear me? Sorry, Arch. <laughs> Just so you can hear, I want you to hear. Yes, I can hear. I'm that. talking about common rebirth. <laughs> <laughs> Are you interested in karma and rebirth? <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> Now I'm, I'm teaching this just in the way of a practical understanding of these particular concepts so that they are meaningful to you in your practice of meditation. I, I don't like to get theoretical or speculative about these things. Now like the, the uh, teaching of reincarnation is really not a, a Buddhist teaching at all. Uh, that's um, a Hindu kind of, more Hindu, in, in its uh, in their treatment of rebirth of reincarnation is like you go from one body to another and so forth. They're like in the Hindu caste system. If you're born into one caste, that means that there's that you have to wait uh, for the next. If you live a good life as an untouchable caste Hindu, then. You might get reborn the next lifetime into a higher, higher caste. Now, in Buddhism, that is that wouldn't be uh, that would be considered sila uh, paramasa or superstition, because it cannot be proved in any way, and it and it just tends to make one think that uh, somehow there is a purity in a in a being born in a certain class or caste. Like if you happen to be born as a Brahmin, that means that somehow you're purer than, or more pure than someone who is born as an untouchable. But as we all can see that whatever Brahmins, people born in the, the Brahmin caste, can be just as nasty, rotten, and impure as the meanest untouchable person. <laughs> So that uh, it's not, uh, and the and untouchable people can be pure of heart, if they live good lives and and uh, use wisdom. So Buddha taught that in and there's a beautiful the last section of the Dhammapada, the beautiful poetic verses of the Brahmana Vaga, and Buddha uh, says, "What is a Brahman? The Brahman means pure." the purified one, which means, and the Buddha said, is the pure of heart. It's a mental thing, not a kind of class thing or caste. It's not physical. What your race, 
class, caste, sex is, has nothing to do with purity. Purity is, there's no, these things are not pure in themselves. They're just perceptions of, uh, that we, we uh, ascribe certain qualities to, which may not be there at all, just if you believe in them. So purity is a mental thing. It's not, it's something that, so being reborn into the pure lands is a mental rebirth, not a physical one. So in your compassionate, kind, generous, moral, and so forth, then this is a, a way toward being, being reborn in a pure condition, the idea of purity. So rebirth, the, the Buddhists don't use reincarnation at all, that word is, doesn't apply to anything Buddhist. Where we use the word rebirth. So rebirth is a mental thing, it's not physical. And rebirth is something that goes on all the time in your, what you're doing all the time. And, and you can see rebirth directly, you don't have to believe in a theory of rebirth. Now since there is no self, there is nothing to be reborn again as a kind of person, uh, personal essence or soul that carries through from one uh, lifetime to the next, but there is desire being reborn. <coughs> So that if you if you are uh, say you're, you're ha if you're a heedless person, unawakened, ignorant human being that doesn't understand the truth, doesn't look, isn't mindful, then the rebirth process carries on and on and on and on. Such as just note in your own life how you just uh, become accustomed to certain uh, habits. Uh, which you which you often would say when you're frightened, what do you do? What what do you do when you're frightened? What do you do when you're uh, feeling uncertain? What do you do when there's nothing to do? Like you can see when say if you go home at <coughs> night and you you turn on the you switch on the light, don't you? So you can be in the light because you like the light. You don't like to live in the dark. And then you might go to the refrigerator and, and make uh, and get something to eat. That's a rebirth, isn't it? You're absorbing into into uh, into uh, pleasure of eating. Then you you eat so much food and you get tired of eating, and then you go turn on the telly television, and you absorb into the television program. You're reborn. You're you're concentrated. You're absorbing. So. So birth is like what is a, a physical birth, but the being the finding a place to be reborn. You go to a womb and get reborn again. So in in uh, and these are meant, but these are mental things because these are the rebirths we can know directly. You seek the wombs that you are accustomed to seeking. for to get reborn again into some state of happiness or security. So the wombs can be anything with eat, with food, a sense of taste, smell, sight, sound, touch or thought. So you seek wombs or places to be reborn again, a place where you can feel safe, protected, that is certain and definite, with the structures uh, that you're used to. So, heedless, ignorant beings are always seeking rebirth in the sense worlds, the sense pleasures, or intellectual pleasures. Now, this is the kind. This is what we can watch in our mind. This is since there's not a person being reborn. It's there's not a kind of soul or essence soul essence that, that goes from, say, a ham sandwich to a television set. <laughs> it's just 
uh, a force of habit, isn't there? Desire. Now notice the nature of desire. Desire is always looking for something or trying to get rid of something. Just watch desire in your own mind. It's always looking for something. That kind of restlessness that when you're frightened, you're uncertain, you're looking for something certain. When you don't know what to do, you have this, you feel this uh, kind of momentum of desire, looking for any old thing. You start just playing with picking up things like this, twiddling your thumbs, picking your nose, doing <laughs> just to be doing something. People smoke cigarettes, take, eat food, smoke cigarettes, knit. Read books, watch television, <laughs> chat, look around at this, look around at that. And all this is, is just the, the force of habit, isn't it? The person doesn't know what he's doing most of the time, he just does, does these things out of habit. Now when you've had enough rebirth, you've, you've had something, to, you've had three ham sandwiches, <laughs> four McDonald's hamburgers, <laughs> two pizzas, you can't, you know, your stomach is, is out to here, you can't stand to be reborn into another pizza. <laughs> well, off you go to the television. You watch, you watch, you get reborn into the things that are going on the television. So you're going up and down, the lovely stories of romance, adventure and excitement, the news, the, the cheerful broadcasts of the daily news about how wonderful the world is, <laughs> to cheer you up. <laughs> A few commercials, the cigarettes, beer, whiskey, <laughs> and then, then you get tired, you get satiated, you can't stand to watch television, you become bored with it. You get bored with eating food, so you go and seek rebirth in the television set. Because you, you can't, you, 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 you switch, when you're bored with something, you have another, you, you can only you want to find some other place to be reborn again. So you go to watch television, to the site. Thing. And then you get bored, weary of television, then you go to, say, read a book. And then you, then reading a book, you get tired, you can only be interested in that for a while, and you become bored, and then you go to a, uh, turn on your stereophonic uh, high fidelity uh, set that has speakers all around the room blast you for a while and then then you have a drink uh, and cigarettes and uh, talking on the you call your friend on the telephone you look into the mirror for a while <laughs> 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 and then you're, by that time you're you're bored with with any other. You can't stand the idea of being born again. You think I just want to not exist. I want to. You don't actually think this. It's just a habit. So you go up to your room and you crash out on your bed <laughs> and annihilate yourself with sleep. So there's a desire to not be at all, isn't there? Desire to just not exist, desire to be annihilated and destroyed is what why people like to sleep a lot because they 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 get exhausted with becoming things, being reborn all the time. It's boring being reborn. So you just like to not exist anymore. Or you can take all kinds of drugs now, kind of tablets that kind of knock you out for hours on end. So there's a desire to, for sense pleasure, isn't there? For to have sensory ple uh, experience, food, what you see, smell, taste, touch, desire to become something. 
So you might spend the evening busily studying uh, uh, dressmaking or engineering or something, to become something. Desire to become some ideal. <coughs> or desire to be annihilated, to not exist at all. To get rid of things, not to be reborn again, but to just be destroyed. So there's three kinds of desire. Gamadana, Pavadana, Vipavadana. Uh, desire for sense pleasure, desire for becoming, desire for annihilation. Now these three are what, what are the cause of rebirth. So it's desire that's being reborn. Now like, you get bored with eating, don't you, if you eat too much. You don't, you'd lose your desire. You, des you, you desire not to eat anything after a while. You, you leave it. But then, uh, say, uh, an hour later or so, something happens, you feel upset, frightened, so off you go and start eating a piece of cake. And so that we, whenever we're frightened or uninsecure, bored, uh, any of these things, we tend to seek rebirth in some kind of sense experience or, into, or some kind of uh, dr drugs, sex, all these things are ways that people are constantly using these things to, to when they're frightened, insecure, bored, uh, weary, uh, and, and this, they decide they want to have some kind of excitement some kind of, absorb into some kind of sensory experience. Be absorbed, be completely lost in, the, in some kind of sensory experience. <coughs> and then you can only uh, be absorbed so long, and then it ends, <coughs> and then there's a desire for something else, or to be annihilated. To not have to, to go through anything else again. So these are the rebirths that, that one can witness in meditation. So you begin, you understand what it is. So that, now, if you understand it on this level, you'll understand how it must operate uh, on the death of the body, a human, bo a human being. Because the last wish of a person is to be, if he's heedless and, desire, and full of desire, it's probably to be reborn again. To find another human birth, to be, to find some womb to jump into. So that, that, but that's desire. That's not. That's the desire operates is, is as energy in the universe. Does it? So it, the desire for rebirth can would be to say find another <coughs> to be reborn again in, in the human form. Now we can only know this through our watching of our own mind. Just to see the force of habit of when, uh, say, if, if say if you were if you were dying and you didn't want to die, what would when you were dying? What would be the most likely thing that you think about? <laughs> <coughs> would be to cling to some form of life again. Something that some some great desire, passion of your life would arise, and you'd and you'd uh, that would probably be on your dying moment. The thing that would be carried on in 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 the samsara, that desire, seeking some form of of uh, materialization. Just like the momentum of your habits are always materializing in forms, aren't they? What you really desire and want, you. You're always, there's always this seeking for it in some material way, some direct experience, some kind of sense pleasure, some kind of intellectual pleasure, or desire for annihilation, which is just repression, isn't it? Trying to get rid of desires that you don't that you don't like. Try not to have them.
Now karma is the, it means the it's obvious that karma in its most simple explanation is like for example being born birth conditions death doesn't it if you were not born you wouldn't die if if your body was was never born there'd be no it wouldn't get old get sick or die would it <laughs> quite obvious there so are that birth the conditions old age sickness and death that's the law of karma so people ask people will say ask me questions like this I know this person who uh, was good all her life she never did anything wrong she's a good person uh, she worked hard self-sacrificing and so forth they go on praising this woman but she died, she died in pain, agony, terrible kind of things of, of a terrible cancer. <coughs> now why would this happen to her? What did she do to deserve that terrible pain and terrible sickness? They want you to say, well maybe in a previous life she, she did something nasty and she's paying for it in this one. But that's speculation again. That is a silly kind of answer. But you can say, it's because she was born. If she hadn't been born, she wouldn't get sick and she wouldn't die. <laughs> so we have, why, do, why do we have the problems we do have? Why do we get sick? Why do we have pain? Why do we have uh, all these problems? Sorrow, despair, grief, anguish, because of birth. Birth conditions them all. Now this is karma. We have to recognize in a very simple way that birth conditions anguish, despair, grief and sorrow, old age, sickness and death. Now when you recognize this, then you're not going to, uh, say, be surprised at anything that happens to you. <laughs> because somehow there's this idea that, that somehow you shouldn't have to experience any of these things. I'm going to get, and I'm not going to get old, I'm not going to ever get sick, and I hope to escape death. I hope by the time, uh, in a few years, science will come up with a cure for death, in which we will never have to die. I think, hope that some people have incredible faith in science. And science will come up with a quick solution so that I won't have to die. I'll be able to live forever. We'll get rid of sickness, complete the science, will 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 annihilate illnesses like 20 30 years ago that was the big hope wasn't it I remember in the states and we used to think science is going to solve all our problems this was in the 1950s modern science is going to solve all our problems and modern psychiatry and drugs and chemistry physics all these things in a few years we'll have conquered all illnesses all mental illnesses will be eradicated through chemistry, and we'll have, uh, and they'll be, they look like what they've done, they've cured, they no more tuberculosis, smallpox, these things. We'll wipe out all diseases, and we'll have no none of that. And we'll have material prosperity. Everybody will have money, have cars, have beautiful homes, because science, Technology will create this wonderful paradise. There'll be no old age, sickness. They'll be able to stop the aging process. We'll be able to, when you have a defective liver, you, science will discover a new kind of material that will replace your liver, your spleen, your tummy, your intestines. We'll have plastic hearts and plastic livers. 
kidney. <laughs> When these, when these <coughs> ones wear out, we'll just replace them. Just like automobile parts. There was that kind of hope. There's this kind of uh, hope, the expectation that somehow science would be able to make us happy, take, cure all our suffering, take us away from pain. Because of this great ma ma faith in materialism, in scientific thought and reason and experimentation. But 20, 30, well, 30 years later, what, what have we? Increasing amount of mental illness? Increasing amount of I mean, sickness is just as much a problem as ever. There's there's people still, old age is now, you know, people just don't know what to do. There's no way you can stop it. <coughs> and death, the inevitable end of a body, is as ever real a, 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 a presence as it ever was at any time in history. In fact, we've gotten so clever, we've now managed to get to the point where we could blow up the whole earth and kill everything all at once. <laughs> and science has, has learned how to do that, but hasn't been able to, to get rid of death. <laughs> now another... Uh, explanation of karma is if you do good actions you get a good result, if you do bad actions you get a bad result. So if you do good you get good, if you do bad you get bad. Now then people will say, well I know someone who is really bad, he's, he's cheats and lies and steals and yet he's very rich, he lives in a beautiful house, has beautiful car, has everything, and yet he's a, a crook, a gangster, a villain. Now if the law of karma were, karma were true, if you do good you get good, if you do bad you get bad, how does this man, why doesn't he suffer? Why, why does he have everything so, so, all these wonderful things? And he doesn't seem to get caught. He lives this wonderful life. But that's how it seems, isn't it? You think, because, you might think that because he has a big car, beautiful house, a lot of money, that somehow he's a happy person. But if you've been a thief, a crook, a gangster, a killer, and so forth, you must re realize the result in karma is, is that you've got all these memories of what you've done. Now even if you've got a lovely house, cars and all these wonderful things, you're sitting in your beautifully decorated living room, sitting there, all, and, and all you have are memories of how you acquired all this, how many people you've, you've uh, taken advantage of, lied to, and so forth. Do you think you're going to feel very happy or safe while you're sitting in this elegant living room? What do gangsters have to do? What do criminals? They have to drink all the time, take drugs, sedatives, live in places where they're constantly, because where they feel safe, have burglar alarms, big, ugly, nasty dogs that bar, spiked fences, <laughs> bodyguards, big, nasty, ugly men that they have to guard everything. <coughs> Wherever they go, they have to go incognito and sneak around. There was a place in Thailand, of, of, this was some Thai people were telling me, one of the biggest um, meat uh, 
industrialists in Bangkok. He has he slaughters more uh, animals than anyone else in Thailand. I mean, not directly, but he's responsible. And he's very, very rich, very, very wealthy. But he's so frightened all the time. He has. He lives. He and his wife live in the, in the, uh, in in a little hut in back, and they don't. They're afraid to live in the big house. And they have big Mercedes Benz uh, limousine car, but they don't dare ride in it. So they 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 ride in a little kind of like Volkswagen or something like that. Nobody would notice. And they're constantly. F uh, fear that somebody's going to kill them. So even though they have this lovely house, all these servants, everything, they have to live hiding away somewhere in, in behind it all, and then sneak out. And they can't sit, and only their chauffeur probably gets to ride in the big Mercedes Benz limousine. <laughs> So we, we should envy people like this. <laughs> but test them out in your own mind. You know, see, uh, when you lie, or when you do just say, don't go around killing or robbing banks or doing things like that, but say, just from your own experience, if you, if you, if you tell lies or even gossip about someone, or, or, uh, take some some little thing. What does it, when you sit and meditate, does it make you feel good? Is it something that you want to come and tell me? Say, Venerable Sumato, I just told a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Is it something you want to share with, with good people when you've done something mean and, and not very good? Is it something you want, you, you're hoping that your mother and father and all the good people in the world will know about? Or is it something you don't even want to know about? That you'd like to forget and not have to remember at all. So remember that what we do, we have to remember. We have a memory, a retentive memory. These human brains, they retain things. So what we do, we remember. And if we do bad things, then we have bad memories. And if we do good things, we have good memories. So it's like that. Now if you do good things, if you're kind and generous and you sit in the memory and rise, I just helped some poor person, <coughs> did something good, it is a, a kind of happy feeling that comes. That happy feeling helps in meditation. It, 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 the, one of the factors of enlightenment is a, a kind of joy, a rapture. It comes from reflecting on good deeds that we've done. When we've been kind and considerate, sensitive, helpful and generous, it makes us feel happy when we think of it. So that's the result of doing good, isn't it? Good karma. When we do bad, then we have to remember we have bad memories. Okay. Now this is the kind of karmic karma that you can prove to yourself. I want you to, to, to understand this through not, not believing what I say, but by reflecting and observing how it works in your own life. Let's watch the rebirth process going on. <clears throat> what is it that goes from the refrigerator to the television set? Is that a person? Is, I mean, is that what your real soul is? Uh, your, your true essence that's going to be carried on through eternity? Is that which takes you from the refrigerator to the television set? Is that, is that what your soul is? Or is it desire? <laughs> Just a kind of aimless wandering out of habit. 
just looking for something to do, something to absorb into. You don't know, what, what do I do now? Oh well, I'll go eat something. And you eat something, now what do I do? Well, you go watch television set. Or go have a smoke some uh, marijuana. Or go to the cinema hall. Or go to the beer hall. All these things are just an aimless wandering, looking for something to do, something, some place to be absorbed, something to absorb into. Like when you go to cinema, you want to get, if it, if it, if it, if it's so, if it's a really terrible cinema show, then you can't absorb into it. I mean, it's so silly and stupid that you, you feel averse to it and get up and leave. But if it's a really good film, then you feel completely absorbed into it when the when the romantic scenes are, are going on in the film. You feel you feel it you're absorbed into the romance itself. You're feeling the happiness when the when the the uh, leading man kisses the leading lady, you're feeling the joy of that kiss. <laughs> When he deserts her for the, for another lady, you're feeling the pain and sorrow, the anger, resentment. If it's really well done, if it, it can completely delude you, why do we go to such things? Because, like, in a, people like to go to be frightened out of their wits too. The horror films. If it's a really good horror film, it scares you to death. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> if it's really a bad one, if it's really badly done, it doesn't fool you in the least. You think, oh, it didn't, it didn't frighten me in the least. I want my money back. There's nothing scary about that. I, I want to have. I want to get my money back. Wasn't worth. It. <laughs> but if you came out absolutely shaking, terrified out of your wit, you think that was a smashing film. Really great. <laughs> it's interesting how people go spend money to be scared out of their wits, <laughs> to be terrified, horrified. <laughs> I make a lot of money off horror films, I think. So that we like to absorb into things like that, the, the kind of beauty and glamour an excitement, like war is exciting, isn't it? We go to war films or, or cowboy films because the shooting, uh, murder, crime, atrocities, torture, all these things are terribly <coughs> exciting to the mind. When you see on a newspaper line, atrocity, you think, oh, I've got to read that. <laughs> Rape. Oh, that's <laughs> murder. Oh, <laughs> so violence uh, or sex, all these things are exciting, they excite the mind when you're bored and drear, uh, kind of just in a dreary, boring state of mind, but we seek excitement. We, we, pornography is, is, a, is a rebirth, isn't it? To seek excitement in, in the excitement uh, of, of uh, sexuality. Or in violence. Scandals are exciting. You read about people doing uh, being corrupt, famous people, politicians or film stars or whatever. Uh, we, we can hardly resist reading about all the awful things they've done. During the Watergate scandals in America, I was living in Thailand at the time. My mother wrote me. My mother's a very sweet old lady and very kind-hearted person. She said, she said, the Watergate scandal, she says, she says, it's really terrible what's going on. 
uh, in one way, she said, it's uh, very disillusioning and upsetting to us to realize all the corruption in, the, the, uh, in our government. She said, in another way, it's, it's really exciting because every day you get a new scandal. <laughs> <laughs> Every day we can expect a new kind of expose. <laughs> a new exposure of some horrible scandal. And so that's exciting, isn't it? That's what newspapers are uh, in London. In London the newspapers, some of them are really gross. I love to play up the most miserable kind of things that human beings do and make it kind of headline news. People buy these things and read them on the undergrounds in the morning, <laughs> absorbing into the scandals of other people. Now, excitement, now recognize that excitement is a very compelling thing, to, that kind of vibration, the frantic uh, vibration of excitement. It's easy to absorb into anything exciting, isn't it? It's much easier to absorb into an exciting television program than into uh, your own normal breath, isn't it? It takes a lot of work to absorb into, into normal breathing. But if we had a television set here and had really uh, exciting things going on, we'd be sitting here. wouldn't have any problem with, with concentration. <laughs> uh, but if things become more monotonous, routine, and and less frantic, then we become. It takes more effort from us, doesn't it? Because the eff the excitement has its own kind of energy that we can absorb into. Exciting rhythms and that. Has, has the energy and we can just absorb into it, we can be energized through the exciting conditions around us. It's like going to football games. In Britain, the, the football games, people can get terribly uh, excited and violent. Mobs of people are terribly exciting like Mardi Gras festivals and all that, to get to go into a mob of people all doing exciting things. Or, say, a, a mob that's, that's out to kill somebody, mob violence, is very, must be very exciting. They kill, 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 and everybody starts saying, kill, kill, and pretty soon you start killing, and it's terribly exciting. So, just, I'm just pointing out to you the the compel uh, how compelling excitement is, and why people when you're when you're not mindful and ha and not wise, then you're easily pulled into these things because they they're they're very they're very seductive. You don't have to you don't have to use any you can't resist if you have no wisdom you can't resist you just get pulled along with the mob. War is a very exciting thing, not in reality, but in in uh, in news, and in and of course in a in a film, a cinema film about war, they don't show you the dreary ugliness of war unless they're they're trying to expose that. But then they're not the exciting war films that you go to see when when you go to see kind of like heroes and all that. Attacking the enemy and winning the <laughs> battle and all that. 
They do make films, don't they, about the dreariness of war. But generally, we go to war films to be excited. Killing, murder, atrocity, torture, all these things excite our mind. Now, what calms the mind is, say, uh, Anapanasati, the breathing. What calms the mind? Looking at nature, doesn't it? Looking at the sky. Look at the sky sometime. Look at the look at a lake, a pool of water. Look at a forest of, or a meadow. You see, these tend to calm, pacify the mind. What what calms the mind is like. Uh, say chanting, or or say rhythms that are tend to be monotonous rather than exciting. Chanting calms the mind. And if we were going into kind of fast jungle rhythms, <laughs> we'd get excited. It'd be, it be so Nothing exciting in that. Is it? <laughs> now this is to describe to you well and to suggest to you ways of calming the mind, getting away from exciting. When you go back to to your homes after this retreat, you just feel a sense of things impinging on your senses because you have developed a calm now that you wouldn't have if you were living in Bern or Zurich or other cities. When you're away, when you're quiet and you don't talk very much and you don't do thing, exciting things. You're not involved in romantic things. You're not. You're not. Uh, you're just more or less sub- like here, surrendering to a form, and and just watching your mind, watching your breath, listening, just sitting, standing, walking, lying down. We're not here trying to excite, stimulate each other with interesting concepts or. Conversation. We're listening, watching. When we do things, we do them for calm rather than for excitement. Now, when you go back to say homes, to cities and so forth, cities are very exciting places. They tend to give off a, a much more fast vibration. Like when you've been living at Chithurst for a few months, and then you go to London, you just feel the things on the senses change much more, kind of fast movements and just in the eye consciousness. So things tend to be much more frantic and fast when you get closer to London. (coughs) You can feel it affecting your mind. Because the images, the things that uh, your mind is a mirror, so it reflects, reflects London. So London is not an especially peaceful place to be. One doesn't go to London for calm. One goes there for excitement. So when we live lives heedlessly, when we live our life without any kind of wisdom or understanding of it, we just get caught up in in just finding ways of seeking excitement. When you get bored, you seek excitement. When you get too much, when you get bored with excitement, you seek annihilation. You get caught up in just just following, just a creature of habit, a, a habit, a helpless victim of fate. Just a helpless victim of habits. 
a conditioned creature, just like the Pavlovian dog. You just ring the bell, salivate. You're conditioned to just do things according to signs and stimulation of various things until you awaken and watch and observe nature. Now, to do good, you get a good result. The law of common. To do bad, you get a bad result. Now, this is immediate. As you live more carefully, more responsibly, more kindly, you, you're going to feel happier, as all. Well, because that's the result. Maybe things, maybe there still be uh, unfortunate things happening. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to get away from pain and sickness and so forth. But you needn't create sorrow, despair, anguish in your mind. You, need, you can refrain from getting caught up in conditions that bring these if you live wisely. And then, just having been born, your body having been born, inevitably has to reap the karmic result of old age, sickness and death. But as you understand this, and you no longer seek your identity with the body, you understand it, know it, then you then you don't expect it to otherwise. So it's peaceful. You're at peace with the changing nature and the karmic predicaments of a human body. You aren't demanding that it be otherwise. You can cope with it. And then, if you're mindful when you die, what is there to get reborn again? if there's not wishing for some other thing, if there's not longing to have another birth, or to do something, if you're at peace with the dying process of your body, what, what can be reborn? Because there's no desire there. There's only mindfulness, wisdom, recognition, there's release, surrender, liberation from the heaviness of a human body. Sounds rather nice to me, actually. <laughs> when I think about my death, I think, oh, it'd be really nice to die. <laughs> Not something that I uh, dread at all. Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just this that dies, isn't it? This body reaches its end, time for it to no longer is uh, needs to be alive. So let it go back, let it break up, let it cease. Mm. And we let it go, and then it's it, the body rots, decays, the worms crawl in and the worms crawl out. <laughs> I think that's very nice. Do the worms a lot of good. I hope so. <laughs> I hope it does. <laughs> no. In common rebirth, I'm just bringing these down to not to exotic religious subjects, but to very practical ways that we can see how these operate. Because as human beings we have to learn from now. It's not, not any good to speculate about what you'll be reborn as in in the next life, is it? I think that's a waste, waste of time. Buddha said it was vain thinking. 
or to try to figure out what you were in a previous life. Have you ever had any past life experiences, Ajahn Sumito? Do you know, did you ever, have you seen in what you were in a previous life? I haven't. I don't know anything about previous lives. Well, I could speculate about it. I could, I've come up with some rather interesting speculation. <laughs> Because it's a rather fascinating thing to think about. But then I thought, you know, if I, even if all this were true, and I had been, say, Napoleon, <laughs> and I remembered now that in previous life I'd been Napoleon, what would I remember? I remember, I just have memories of that time when I'm being an emperor and so forth and being responsible for a lot of misery <laughs> and so I mean it would be just memories of say France in the 1800s or Russia <laughs> now what now in this lifetime I've lived uh a good many years, and I have memories of this lifetime. I remember like 40 years ago, I was a boy uh, studying in, in a grammar school in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. My name was Robert, and I went to a school called John Muir Grade School. And I had a teacher when I was eight years old called Miss Diepenbrock. <laughs> now that might not be able to to impress anyone compared to say remembering <laughs> the war with, with with Russia back in eighteen twelve or something. Because that that would be rather a wonderful thing. A really impress have you all and say, I have yes I was Napoleon <laughs> <laughs> but when I say what I can remember what I can remember is being eight year old Robert Jackman in a in a school in Seattle Washington that doesn't you say so what <laughs> but what both have in common is that they're memories aren't they and if I actually could remember being Napoleon and I had, and then I, then I can remember being Robert Jackman. Both those are memories. Now they they arise here and now. So that's all you have to know. Those are just memories. It does. It what what does it matter whether whether your name was Napoleon, or Robert Jackman, or. Sydney or Rachel or Queen of Sheba. <laughs> Except the perception that, of the value that we give it, like somehow being Napoleon is a little more impressive to most people than being Robert. <laughs> Unless Robert is the name of the latest rock star. <laughs> and then that might be more impressive than Napoleon. Uh, this is, you see, the memory. All you have to know is memory is memory. So I can remember previous lives. See? In this way, I can remember it 40 years ago. I can, our memories come up from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, yesterday. They're all previous lives. They're having been living previously in their memories that, that I, they say, come up in, the, in now. That's all you need to know. Just that much. Memory is a memory. It arises, it passes away, and it's not self. Then, what will happen to me in the future? When I die, uh, people will come and they say, I've done this terrible thing in my life. I'm responsible for this awful thing. What will happen to me? Will I, in the next life, what 
what can I expect to happen to me? Will I go to hell? Will I be reborn and reincarnated as a toad or a grasshopper or something? What will happen to me? <laughs> Frightened about what might happen, the punishment, the terrible fate that awaits them for having done something bad, something evil. You can speculate about it, but the result of having done something bad in the past is fear, isn't it? Now, you're frightened. You don't know what might happen. And the future is always the unknown. The future is the great unknown. The future will always be the unknown. The uncertain, the mystery. So anything from your past you could project into the future. Which we do all the time, isn't it? We, we do that. We fill the future, the emptiness of the future, with all kinds of ideas and fears, fantasies. But it's always in the now that we do this. So that's the seeking rebirth in something. Like, maybe we want to punish ourselves. We do. We have a strong desire to punish ourselves for having done something bad. <clears throat> So sometimes we do deliberately seek situations in which we're going to be punished. Sometimes people get very upset when they want, they, they'd like me to punish them. Being an authority figure and so forth, I think I should go around kind of spanking people. <laughs> like Chitters, somebody does something bad, I should go and say, you... You are very bad and naughty, and you should have to do a penance. Some people actually want me to do that. Because they, they feel better if they've been punished. But that's very immature, <coughs> isn't it? It's still like a child. Rather than recognizing this, and understanding it, and letting it go. That takes much more... That takes wisdom, doesn't it? That takes wisdom. So, inclining to Nibbana is not a, not a something for children. For little creatures who need to be spanked and scolded and prodded and pushed. <laughs> that's not... That's, children, you have to do a certain amount of that with because they... They, uh, they don't have wisdom. They have to be guided and directed and so forth. Otherwise they won't... They need, they, need, they, they, they need that kind of support. But when you're developing spiritually, you have to develop the strength from your own mind. You can't expect... Don't seek it, someone else to do it for you or someone else to to tell you what to do, or to uh, spank you when you're naughty, or to praise you when you're enlightened. <laughs> That's another one. We want somebody to say, oh yes, you're enlightened, you, you've, you've made it, you're a great success. And we say, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it must be true because he says so. But you still don't, you still, you still need someone else to tell you what you are, don't you? or to tell you what you aren't. So, meditation is a real balancing to, of knowing, and knowing the truth beyond doubt, and being responsible for how we live, not because we're afraid that somebody's going to spank us if we don't do it, but because it's the right thing to do, because we understand the law of karma and rebirth, and we know better how to live, and use skillfully the conditions we find that we are still with us, such as our bodies and minds. So, enlightenment is nothing more than growing up, really, being a, a mature human being. It's the perfection of the human, human karma, is enlightenment. 
is for human beings, and it means maturing, balance, being responsible, being a moral, responsible, wise human being. No longer looking for places for, for uh, I want somebody to love me. That's a strong one, isn't it? I want somebody to love me. So we, you know, we can't find it, maybe we can't find it in someone else, so we, we want God to love us. We say, I believe in a God that loves me. <clears throat> God loves me, nobody else does but God. <laughs> but that's still an immature thing, isn't it? It's still, we want love from out there, from someone else. So a lot of religion just caters to that level of emotional development, the child, isn't it? God loves you if you do good, and, and it gets angry if you do bad. When you're naughty, you go to hell, and when you're good, you go to heaven. <laughs> so you do good, thinking that if you do bad, God's going to punish you and send you to hell. So you do good because you're afraid of going to hell, not because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, is this is the way of wisdom of growing up and maturing, fulfilling completely, fulfilling the and perfecting the human condition. I mean, you can see enlightenment is something really practical, not far out and fantastic. Something that each one of us can do. Each one of us is capable of moving into that position, being awake. When, we, when we're mature and balanced, we can love. We don't need to be loved by someone else. When you're when you're wise, you just love. There's no need. You don't expect to get it from someone else. When you're a child, you need it from someone else. When you're emotionally immature, you have to have it from someone out outer source, because you 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 can't love yourself yet. You can't you can't give love. You have to just try to get it from something else, from God, from some other person. But when you're mature. And balance, then you can love. So it's nice to be loved by others, but it's not necessary. <laughs> you don't you don't ask that of others. You're not going around saying, "Please love me." You don't need to be loved anymore because one can love when there's wisdom. So that is the maturing of, an, of a human being, isn't it? Balanced, mature, and there's no rebirth in that. Love is a natural radiance from wisdom. It's a natural relationship, way to relate to, to others when there's wisdom. When there's not wisdom, then, then we tend to always be corrupting it, with lust, possessiveness, jealousy, fear of rejection, all these kind of things distort any kind of love we might be able to generate from our own mind. Unless we can love wisely, love through wisdom rather than through desire. Son.
Sukani. Supati Panno Bhagavato Sawaka Sangho Sangha Namah